direct from San Francisco, California. In the heart of the Tenderloin, welcome, welcome to the Given and Podcast. Podcast. San Francisco Lockdown Edition, a subsidiary of Kiffin Ange Productions in association with Kiffin Ange Studios. Online at KiffinAngePodcast.com. And now, Kiffin Ange. And not like the nice Satanists that I'm friends with, you know. <laughs> just wanna... <laughs> this guy was a guy who literally thought he was evil incarnate and that his job was to defy the Christian God and do the most awful evil things imaginable Absolutely. Uh, versus the church of Satan. Who's got some very nice members who I know. Anyway, <laughs> two days later, July 7th, 1985, he came back to Monterey park and he snuck in on Joyce Lucille Nelson, who was 61, beat her to death with his hands and kicked her. And he also left that imprint that the police had been looking for of that very rare and what 11 was and a half about it again at- 11 and a half so the sole of this avia sneaker uh-huh. was very particular to a specific avia sneaker and so the police were able to track where those had been distributed cruised around for a while and then at random which is one of the freakiest things about this he select the homes of, of sophie dickman 63 and he attempted to rape her but he did assault her took her jewelry and when she told him he had everything, he made her swear on Satan that she was being truthful. And that was a real big deal when she explained it to the cops. And suddenly the cops kind of had like a new. They movie. had a, they had yeah. a, exactly. They began to build, if you watch crime television, they began to build the profile. Hmm. So, yeah. So he starts talking about Satan and his attacks, you know, and, and. Ramirez then moves on and purchases, he's up to this point, he's been using guns. And remember, he was at the one scene of the crime and couldn't find a knife. And then Jesus intervened. Well, Richard Ramirez bought a machete on July 20th. And he headed to Glendale, California. That is a brutal, brutal way to kill somebody. My bad. Yep going oh yeah well he breaks into the home of lola nelding 66 and husband maxon he busts into the bedroom ramirez begins to his killing spree violently hacking at both people as they lay in the bed with his Ah. machete oh my gosh yep finally realizing that hacking people to death is probably not the best way to achieve what his overall goal might have been. So he did end up shooting and killing both of them. He then entered the home of the Kovanath family. He shot and killed (sighs) Chanarong Kovanath as he would lie sleeping, right in the sleep, right in the head. He then tied up the couple's eight-year-old son and made Sam Kid, which was the wife, take him through the house to collect any valuables that they had. Before leaving, he again made his victim swear on Satan that she had told the truth about all of the valuables. Apparently, so Satan's a big part of this, and this is more than once he's mentioned this to a victim, and he might have been using a different gun, and now he's got the machete, but the MO is overall still the same. So he either got a, a tip in the media that they were on to him or he felt the, the, the heat or he somehow satiated his bloodlust because it wasn't until Ramirez didn't strike again until like 17 days later. It's 17 days later on August 6th in Northridge, California, and he's in a neighborhood and he did pick the wrong house. He did go to the wrong place. Uh, after breaking into the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson, 27, he crept into the bedroom, waking up Virginia and shooting her in the face with a 25 caliber gun, handgun. He then shot Chris in the temple and tried to flee. Chris put up a fight. Good. And while avoiding being hit two more times by bullets that Richard Ramirez fired at him, Ramirez managed to escape and the couple survived the attack. 
So you got to wonder, I mean, if you're like this serial killer who's been like going around getting away with stuff and suddenly, I mean, did he ever even think, what would I do if somebody resisted? And the fact that these were such, so much younger compared yeah. to everyone else that he chose yeah. to attack was just like madness. After August 6th, two days later, on August 8th, 1985, Ramirez drove another stolen car to Diamond Bar, California. At around 2.30 a.m., he entered the house of Elias, 31, and Sakina Abawath, 27. He killed Elias while he was sleeping, same M.O., following, again, his same M.O. of previous crimes. He beat and sodomized Sakina and made her reveal where the family valuables were, the whole time making her swear to Satan over and over and over. And also making the kid watch again. Um, Three-year-old. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, ty- like, like he yeah. one-year-old walked into this, this situation. Like you he need just to tied it. him up and sat him down and continued on with it. But and didn't cause didn't hurt, trauma. Did he hurt, but didn't hurt the nope. kid physically. No. Nope. Okay. All right. Nope. Wasn't into you. kids. No, but you he was know? into. He was like, definitely oh, into like, some weird su- stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, but you know, like any modern day serial killer, like BTK, like them all, they got to look yeah. themselves up in the newspaper and watch the reports on the news and how famous am I? And, and they got to make sure, you know, when they leave the scene that people know he's the night stalker. Well, they and, want people to know how smart they are. Like, how clever they are exactly exactly so look what i want to be admired for their deeds yeah so august 18th there's a lot he had 10 days later 10 days later oh yeah there's more wait till we get towards the end so 10 days later he broke in and killed uh, a man named peter pan uh, and then brutally beat and assaulted his wife barbara and then when he was done shot barbara in the head and well, at the crime scene, he scrawled the words Jack the Knife and a pentagram in lipstick on the bedroom. Ballistics and shoe prints were quickly matched, though. So if it was him attempting to throw him off the case, it, it obviously didn't work. And uh, our very own Diane Feinstein, the mayor of San Francisco at the time, kind of made a little mistake. There was evidence that police and investigators didn't want anybody to know and she disclosed that information she said they were looking for the 11 and a half avias uh they were looking they were looking for all of this stuff and it ended with ramirez knowing they had a shoe and he threw him off the golden gate bridge that night the evidence was destroyed the lapd was instantly furious with Diane Feinstein in San Francisco because the crimes that had been committed in San Francisco were minimal compared to what was going on in LA and they were seriously building a case. And I have to wonder if that was an on purpose thing or if it was accidental or if she was just looking to get a little. Well, here's the thing is we have to remember that Diane, Diane Feinstein was not an elected mayor. She took over after Mayor Moscone had been assassinated oh. in the very office she worked in. So on one hand in history, I've spent a lot of time pointing a few fingers at Diane Feinstein for fudging that up. But now I've grown older and learned a little bit more about the situation. And I mean, her life couldn't have been all, you know, soda and jelly beans either. So chaotic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So after a few days of lying low, Ramirez made his way south of LA to Mission Viejo in a stolen vehicle. And that night, Ramirez targeted a home and he was heard outside the window of a 13 year old boy. The son woke his parents, and just as his father raced outside, he actually got a really good description of what Ramirez looked like and a partial license plate number of the stolen car. He was able to report it to the police, thinking you know, he had just chased away a thief. Yeah. I know that was the night stalker, but yeah. Right, know, right. Got that license plate. How dare he spying on my little son? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. But this changed things. And, uh, and then uh, that night, after he was chased away, Ramirez encountered his final 
two victims. Thank goodness. Uh, broke into the home of Bill Cairns, 30 years old, and his fiance Inez Erickson, who was only 29, came into their bedroom, shot Carnes three times in the head. He told Inez, who was like petrified, that he was the night stalker. Continuing his pattern, he made her swear over and over again that he loved Satan as he beat her and raped her and sodomized her. Ramirez left and he told Erickson to tell the police. He said the night stalker was here. You can see the conceit in his face. And it's the same thing when you see the interviews with the ice pick killer and the interviews with the big tall guy. Um, Oh, his name will come to me later. Or you can all please correct me in comments or give me a thumbs down because I screwed it all up or <laughs> give me a thumbs up because I got most everything else right. So, but by all means, comment on any part of this We're always video. happy to hear it. Yeah. But here's the good news is they, uh, they got well, oh, they a current head and he and Inez did survive. So that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah. And then... Oh, the this is so awesome. Ending. Dun, dun, dun. S the capture. Yeah, the capture. The capture. So Ramirez did not realize, even though he'd been following the media, remember he was very transient. So the media he's following is newspapers, and newspapers are generally LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle. They're not national. So he was unaware that what he had been up to had become national news and that when Diane Feinstein did that interview, it was on national television. Oh, oh yeah. It was a live press, pr press conference mm. on national television. So all at one time, they had a physical description because of the last few victims, you know, they definitely saw who they were dealing with. They had the tennis shoes. They had fingerprints. Okay. So they were just like within inches and then all of a sudden they had. So not knowing that he was national news, Ramirez got on a bus in Los Angeles and headed to Tucson, Arizona. And his intention was to meet up with his brother and spend a little family time. I don't know how that would have worked out, but his brother wasn't there when he got there. So he just hopped a bus and came back to LA. And the police were in the LAPD bus station looking for the night stalker, but they were looking at departing buses, not arriving buses. And so Ramirez got <laughs> off the bus. <laughs> Why is that funny to me? It's ironic for sure. It's so ironic. That's like, catch me if you can. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's very catch me if you can. Yeah. So, so then Ramirez ends up, um, seeing these uh, Hispanic women pointing at him and using the words, El Matador, Matador. Oh, the killer, the killer. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. then his senses went off and he, oh. he got out the back of the bus station and he ran across the Santa Ana freeway. All right. Nobody's chasing him. But he already knows, you know, he's got to get. And at this time, traffic wasn't as crazy as it used to be. <laughs> oh, traffic is always crazy in LA. There's just absolutely no escaping traffic in LA, especially on Santa Ana Freeway. But he gets across the Santa Ana Freeway and he attempted to carjack a woman. And while he was doing it, she screams loud enough. There's these guys over working on a car. They hear and see the whole situation. Immediately, wow. they have got their crowbars and their wrenches in their yeah. hands. And they go Ironic. after. I know, right? They go after Ramirez. And as Ramirez is running, he tries to carjack two more cars. More people are being added to the mob of chasing Whoa. him. I'm not even really sure if they, any of them knew who they were chasing. They just knew they were chasing a bad guy, right? Yeah. So eventually the mob caught up to Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, in L.A., and they began to beat the snot, I think I can say, out of them. 
they beat the snot out of them. Wow. And ironically, without knowing at all, it was two LAPD police officers that saved Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, that day. From a group of vigilantes who were just yep. looking to... Wow. Richard Ramirez was sentenced to death for his crimes, but he died cheating the system before it could happen. He died of complications associated with B-cell lymphoma, chronic substance abuse, and chronic hepatitis C viral infection. He was 53 years old, and he'd been living in hell on death row there for 20 years. Death, it was discovered through the use of DNA. His first victim was actually a nine-year-old little girl, Mei Liang, in San Francisco. He'd raped, beat, stabbed, and hung her from a pipe there, right where you are, Ange, at a Tenderloin Hotel Ramirez was staying in at the time. How close are you to that hotel? I don't know which hotel it is. I didn't look it up. Oh, we got to find out. If you know, I know, in the I know. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2016 police officials revealed that further DNA evidence indicated a second perpetrator in the... So we had a partner? Yep. First murder what? that they know of. First murder that they know of. There was uh, they, another person there. They seem to know he's a, a juvenile at the time. Oh, his, the other suspect was a kid. I wonder if that was that whole, like, trying to make kids, you know, do what his cousin did to him. You know what I mean? So uh, creepy. That would, you know, I'm not uh. a psychiatrist, but that makes sense. That yeah. He, he wouldn't want to commit his first crime alone, but he would want to dominate the first crime. So he right. might pick somebody younger that he could sort of inspire and also push around a little, you know? How? freaky how scary or maybe just like he creepily wanted to be some awful father figure or something like i don't know man i think based on what we saw and and this is unwritten now we're going completely off script um i watched his trial and he would walk into the courtroom and he'd put his hand up like this and there would be a pentagram drawn on it and that's what you would see on the camera there was a actual, oh, yeah. this is yeah. a whole other episode, but there was a juror that fell in love with him. <gasps> a juror fell in love with him with his rotten teeth? They, they used to send him cookies and he, he got married while he was in jail. Oh my God. The opinions and topics discussed in any Kiffin Anch production or show are meant to be controversial, provocative, and possibly create a conversation that is not already being had. The most important thing to remember about this production is that it has zero educational or historical value other than from a purely popular parody perspective. By listening to this podcast, you understand that it is solely for entertainment purposes. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, parody, scholarship, and research. Kiffin Anch Productions is meant to provide parody in an already difficult life. If you find no humor or entertainment in our productions, well, for goodness sakes, don't listen.